Carrie Ann will be speaking today about oxidative stability of edible oils, uh, an indicator of quality. Carrie Ann is the, is the product manager at Metrom USA in Riverview, Florida. Uh, she has her PhD in material science and engineering from University of Florida. Uh, uh, Carrie Ann has a lot of has had a number of roles working at Metrom. She joined as a member of our applications team, uh, and is currently a product manager at Metrom USA. Uh, Carrie Ann plays a key role in product support, product marketing, and also has experience in developing and implementing ASTM methods. Uh, please welcome me in joining, uh, having Carrie Ann join us and and speak on oxidative stability of edible oils and indicator of quality. Thank you, Larry. And um, thank you for the opportunity this morning to discuss the oxidative stability of edible oils and fats and, and how um, it can be used as a quality ind indicator for these types of products. Um, the oxidative stability of an oil indicates how resistant an oil is to oxidation. And this is important because increased oxidation can lead to oxidative rancidity. Uh, rancidification is the process of complete or incomplete oxidation of hydrol or hydrolysis of fats and oils. Uh, this can be caused by several factors, including air or oxygen, um, light or UV radiation, which along with oxygen promotes oxidation and rancidity. Um, moisture as well as bacterial growth and the presence of moisture can also be a factor in rancidification. Um, all of these result in an unpleasant taste and odor, which is not something that we want in our food products. Um, and this is what we hope to avoid um, with use by, sell by, or best before dates on food and packaging. So there are three pathways to rancidity, so to speak. Um, hydrolytic rancidity, also called hydrolysis, occurs in the absence of air, but with moisture present. Uh, this type of rancidity refers to the odor that develops when uh, triglycerides are hydrolyzed and free fatty acids are released. Uh, microbial rancidity refers to a water-dependent process in which microorganisms uh, such as bacteria or mold use their enzymes to break down fat. Uh, pasteurization or the addition of antioxidant ingredients reduce this process by inhibiting the growth of microorganisms or just destroying them altogether. Uh, oxidative rancidification, also called uh, lipid peroxidation, is caused by the degradation um, by moist, excuse me, by oxygen in the air. This is the main cause of rancid rancidity. Um, uh, of lipids as oxygen is eight times more soluble in oil as it is in water. During this process, uh, double bonds of unsaturated fatty acids present in oils are cleaved uh, by free radical reactions involving molecular oxygen. Uh, this reaction causes the release of bad smelling and highly volatile aldehydes and ketones. Um, how quickly oils and fats go rancid due to the influence of oxygen is dependent on the sample's oxidative stability. Uh, for the rest of our discussion today, I will focus on the um, on oxidative stability and how it can be monitored using the ransom method. So there are three stages to oxidative rancidity. It begins with an initiation stage, uh, which is followed by a propagation stage, and then it ends in a termination stage. So let's look a little bit closer at these three stages. Uh, during the initiation stage, lipids that are present in fats and oils are attacked by hydroxyl radicals in the air. Uh, this results in a lipid radical that is highly reactive and very unstable. Uh, this is the, th the slowest of the three stages, as you'll see in some of the upcoming uh, application slides. 
during the second stage of uh, propagation, these unstable lipid radicals react with oxygen to form lipid peroxide radicals, which react with other lipids to form more lipid peroxides and lipid radicals. So this begins what is called a continuing free radical peroxidation chain reaction or auto oxidation that just repeats over and over again. So this is a cyclical me mechanism um, that results in oxidative degradation of the lipid. Um, the propagation stage is going to be considerably faster than the initiation stage. The final stage is termination, and this stage involves the slowing or the stopping of reactions. Here we see secondary reaction products uh, from the lipid peroxide starting to break down. And these breakdown products can be aldehydes, ketones, alcohols, um, and carbonic acids. They tend to have lower molecular weights, are very volatile seed species, and they cause that bad odor um, or that rancid odor that we sometimes smell. And these breakdown products are what we detect when we uh, use the ransom method. So I'd like to discuss antioxidants briefly as they positively impact oxidative stability of fats and oils. Um, they can be natural or they can be added. Um, antioxidants help to combat uh, rancidity by preventing the degradation of the lipids. So in addition to preventing the degradation of lipids, antioxidants also play a role in the defense mechanism of the body against various diseases. So there are many reasons why antioxidants can be added to, to products. Um, there are three groups of antioxidants that I'd like to cover today. Uh, the first are primary antioxidants or chain breaking substances, also called radical scavengers. These react with free radicals and transform them into more stable compounds. Um, they can be natural compounds such as carotenoids, um, as well as phenolic compounds and other antioxidant species that are found naturally in herbs and spices. Um, there are synthetic antioxidants antioxidants such as BHA, BHT, TBHQ. Um, but due to some suspected cancer promoting properties, there's a growing focus on, on trying to use more natural antioxidants. Um, tocopherol or vitamin E is another phenolic compound that um, scavenges free radicals and reacts with singlet oxygens. Uh, secondary or preventative antioxidants work as complexing agents. Uh, these agents will chelate transition metals as well as um, quench singlet oxygen and work as uh, oxygen scavengers. Uh, they can also aid in regenerating primary antioxidants as well. A couple of examples here are citric acid, phosphoric acid, ascorbic acid, um, EDTA has also been used as a chelating agent in foods to reduce metal-induced uh, lipid ox oxidation due to the presence of iron. The third class of antioxidants are UV deactivators. Uh, these will absorb um, UV light and slow down the oxidative rancidity process. A couple of examples listed are uh, phenyl, salicy phenyl salicylate as well as hydroxybenzophenone. Rancidification is a natural process um, that we would like to be able to predict in order to determine the viability of products that are sold and stored. Uh, oils that remain stable over longer periods of time command a higher price point as they lead to a higher quality end product. Also, it's beneficial to be able to determine how antioxidants impact the oxidative stability of oils and food products. Uh, however, Natural oxidation in room temperature is a very, very slow process and even longer with uh, any antioxidants present. So we use the ransom technique to accelerate this process. Instead of it taking weeks, months, or even years, it only takes hours. Um, with the ransom method, we age the sample at elevated temperatures, uh, purging it constantly with air through the analysis, and we detect reaction products by conductivity. Um, we use the accelerated aging or induction time to help determine how long the oil uh, remains usable. There are four major components to the Ransomat. Um, 
there's airflow or oxygen that is added to the sample by an internal pump throughout the measurement. Uh, the sample is weighed into a reaction vessel where it's placed into a heating block. Uh, there's a measuring vessel to de detect the secondary byproducts, and there's um, the heating block that heats the sample to help accelerate the aging process. Uh, the RANSMET has two independent measuring blocks that allows up to eight samples to be measured simultaneously. And the measurement of each sample can be started individually. So if one sample ends, you can remove it and add another sample and then start that process all over again. The operation of the RANSMET is fairly simple. The sample is weighed into the reaction vessel and the measuring cell is filled with distilled water. Uh, we connect the lids and a couple of tubes and then the determination can be started. During the analysis, the sample is kept at a constant temperature in a closed reaction vessel, and a continu continuous flow of air is passed through that sample. Uh, peroxides are formed as primary oxidation products um, via oxidation of fatty acids in the sample. After some time, the fatty acids are completely destroyed and low molecular weight organic acids um, such as formic or acetic acid are formed as secondary oxidation products, in addition to other volatile uh, organic species. Uh, these secondary oxidation products are uh, conducted by airflow into a measuring vessel that contains distilled water as an absorption solution. Uh, the con conductivity of the water is continuously being recorded throughout the measurement, and as soon as um, volatile carboxylic acids are formed in the sample, it causes an increase in conductivity in the measuring vessel. Uh, the time until the secondary oxidation products occur is called the induction time. And this is a measure of the oxidative stability of the sample. There are um, two evaluation algorithms that are used by the software. Uh, the first is the induction time or induction period that's shown in red. Um, this algorithm is used in food applications. The second is stability time that's shown in black. Um, it is the time until a defined conductivity stage has been achieved. And this is usually um, used for PVC determinations where they're trying to look at a thermal stability. For this talk, we will focus on induction time. So here we have the output of an oxidative stability measurement performed by the RANSIMAT. Uh, the green curve shows the oxi uh, excuse me, the conductivity change over the time of the analysis. The dark blue curve is the second derivative of the conductivity measurement. So the second derivative of the green curve. Uh, the light blue line is the evaluation sensitivity. And the second derivative or the dark blue curve um, has to exceed that blue line in order for the measurement to be considered viable. Um, the default here is one for most applications. The red line indicates the maximum of the second derivative curve, and this determines the induction time. So what can influence an oxidative stability measurement? Uh, temperature has the most significant effect on induction time. Uh, typical temperature ranges can be from about 80 degrees to 180 degrees Celsius, but I think about 120 degrees Celsius is the most common temperature that's used. Uh, the rule of thumb is that a 10 degrees Celsius increase in temperature can lead to a 50% decrease in induction, in, excuse me, induction time. So ideally, we want to make sure that we have a maximum deviation of temperature of 0.3 degrees Celsius and that the stability of the temperature have less than 0.1 uh, degrees Celsius deviation. Uh, therefore, it's very important to carry out a temperature correction with the use of a calibrated temperature sensor in order to correct for any deviations. Um, gas flow has only a very small influence on results. We weren't able to see any changes within um, plus or minus 10% of the flow change. Um, sample weight can have a small influence. There can be a cooling effect depending on the sample weight. So we want to make sure that we keep that as consistent as possible. Oops. Here you can see the influence of temperature on induction time. Um, the induction time decreases from 
55 hours to less than two hours when temperature is increased from 80 degrees Celsius to 130 degrees Celsius. We use an extrapolation approximation in order to show induction time as a function of temperature. Uh, excuse me, extrapolation to room temperature can provide a rough estimate of shelf life. There is, however, a high degree of statistical uncertainty involved in the, in the extrapolation technique. So I just want you guys to be aware of that. Um, there are two models that are available for extrapolation. First, there is an empirical Q10 approach. Uh, this is based on the observation that the induction time approximately doubles with each 10 degrees um, Celsius reduction in sample temperature. Uh, the second model also in, incorporates reaction kinetics. It is based on the Arrhenius equation um, and it describes the temperature dependence of the reaction uh, rate constant. Uh, the Q10 is probably the most frequently used extrapolation method. So when we talk about oxidative stability, um, the most frequently asked question is, you know, can oxidation stability predict shelf life? Um, the induction time and extrapolation calculations cannot by themselves determine shelf life, and I have to be clear about that. Um, there are other factors that can impact the shelf life of a product um, that the ransom mat just cannot account for. A couple of examples are enzymes, bacteria, and microorganisms, as well as hydrolytic uh, rancidity. The measurements uh, using the ransom mat are generally made uh, at temperatures between 100 degrees Celsius and 130 degrees Celsius. Um, in addition to accelerating the oxidation process, uh, these temperatures can cause side reactions, which do not occur when samples are stored under normal conditions. Uh, for example, volatile antioxidants may be driven out during this process. Also, in measurements with the ransom mat, air is con uh, continuously being fed through the sample um, while a typical product is stored in closed containers to prevent oxidation. So in the end, induction time determined using the ransom mat only gives an indication um, which must be correlated with actual shelf life studies um, with the use of storage tests. Many different types of samples can be analyzed using the ransom mat technique. Um, vegetable fats and oils such as soybeans, sunflower, coconut, peanut oil, palm oil, um, you know, fat and oil containing products, um, instant foods, chocolates, cookies, cereals, meats and sausages, uh, animal fats, butters, fish oils, lards, etc. Um, and uh, increasingly, we're seeing the ransom mat being used in antioxidant research, especially for cosmetic products that contain some of the natural oils um, that are available. So I'm going to wrap up our talk this morning um, with a couple of just quick examples of um, you know, edible fats and oils. So here we see a uh, ransom mat result of a sunflower oil product. And you'll see that it has a nice shape with that slow initiation period um, uh, in approaching the propagation and termination step. And we see that the induction time is clearly noted uh, on the curve. A second example is canola oil or rapeseed oil. Um, as we can see here that the, the, the line is not always a completely flat line at the beginning. However, um, because we're looking at that second derivative, we're able to determine the induction time just as easily for this curve as we were for the previous curve. Oops. Um, there are several standards that are available for edible fats and oils. I have them listed on the screen here. Um, there's an ISO method as well as an AOCS method, uh, an AOM method, and an AO, uh, ASTM method that's available as well. So thank you for your attention today. This is what I have for you. If there are any questions available, I'll be more than happy to answer them at this time. Thanks, thanks, Carrie Ann, uh, for that talk on the ransom. I just had one quick question uh, before we move on to our next speaker, uh, and that is, you know, uh, since we're measuring conductivity and we're using that, does the conductivity need to be calibrated? 
For um, fats and oils and food products, we don't really need to calibrate the conductivity because we're just looking at a change in conductivity. We're not looking at the absolute value. Um, where the calibration would have to occur, I mentioned stability time um, and, and thermal stability tests. In that instance, where we're looking at a specific conductivity measurement, um, in that instance, we would want to calibrate that conductivity cell. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's all the, the questions we have time for at this point, just looking at our schedule. Uh, I think we're going to move on to our next speaker.